This is the first cinema in China. This is where they showed the very first movie, a domestically produced movie in China. And it, it, it was called the um, Ding Junshan, or the sacred building of the Chinese um, building. No, that's, that's a cool cinema. place has got something unique, something different. Even a few weeks ago I was in Suzhou in, the, in Jiangsu. My gosh, it was beautiful. The canal town, the, the boats on the, on the waterway, the bridges, the old houses. Very much the kind of China you would fall in love with, you know, if you could be there. It's just every, every area has got something different. You could go to Shanghai. You told me a story once, Bruce, and I'm hoping I'm going to ask you to share the photograph with mm. me where you um, were picked up by the army. Oh. <laughs> Do you remember that? Do. Are you okay telling that story yeah. on, on camera? I, I mean, it's, it's well known, you know, we've written about yeah. it a lot. I was actually walking in an area of tropical forest in Hainan Island. It so, was when was this? Like? January 1993, okay. Spring Festival, mm. before the tourism. Mm. And uh, in this area, they hardly, hardly ever seen a Westerner. Because mm. this was an, an ethnic area of the Li and Miao nationality. Mm. And it's all tropical forest and um, rice fields, beautiful. And I'm walking, and I thought, I need to get back to town. It was quite a long distance I've been walking. I heard this noise, I thought it was a vehicle coming. It's very rare because the area is very quiet. Mm. So, my gosh, it's the army. Yeah. And I know that. I'd actually walked past an army base earlier on, they were kind of shouting to me. You know. And anyway, he was walking by, I said, This army truck is coming in my my direction. Oh my god. So I keep it, then it, it suddenly screeched a halt, pulled up, and the soldiers just looked down, and they saw me, and they just grabbed me, and they hauled me up onto the back of the truck. One of the soldiers took my hat I had at that time, he takes my hat. He gives me the army hat to be on, you know, everyone's laughing and joking, what the photographs taken, well, you know, huddling each other on the truck. We drive right into town and um, it was it was really brilliant. And it also this the same year in nineteen ninety-three when I was working at uh, the college, Guangdong Foreign Languages at Normal School, the Strathclyde Region had sent me over for never was um, about to go into town. And one of the, the the staff saw me. Bruce, where are you going? I'm going downtown. Oh, um, whereabouts? Of course, I'm going to the Garden Hotel, which are the only bar in Guangzhou, in Guangzhou at that time. Oh, we can arrange to be a lift. There's um, a, a lorry going down uh, into town, and we'll, 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 we'll take it. it. Turned out the lorry was actually a PLA. It was an army lorry, and the soldiers were driving back down, and the soldiers drove me right in to the entrance way, the, the entrance ramp of the hotel. Mm. I yeah. drive you right up to the gate, the door of the hotel, where the, the concierge wearing their white uniforms, white um, hats, and they're looking at this army truck pulling up, and they saw their faces as the soldiers helped me down. i have been standing at the back of the truck on a kind of rail above the driver's car, mm. holding onto this rail as we drove right down through the main streets of Guangzhou <laughs> people. <laughs> and so I'm there, you know, get, you know, get lowered down. Um, oh, uh, the driver, the, the concierge just saluted. Even Chris. <laughs> saluted you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, my soldiers. <laughs> but these are things that happen to you, you know, in China. It, it, um, you, just, you just think every day there's something different happening. Mm. Every day you, you have a different experience. <laughs> And you just laugh, you know, and go through with it all, and uh, what's next? <laughs> how, how do you, because I've seen some of your photographs, how do you take, I mean, you've got some fantastic photographs of local people uh, going yeah. back 20, 30 years. Yeah. What was the reaction like back then when you were taking these photographs and, and local people must have think or must have thought, who, who on earth is this foreigner? You know, Marco Polo well, yeah. guy. 
Well, you were getting sometimes people wondering why does he want to take photographs of ordinary people? Mm. Right? Why? Because when you go back to Scotland, you were giving talks to the Geographical Society, for example, and you were talking about um, you know everyday life in China. Mm. So you're photographing people in the market areas, yeah. you're photographing traders, mm. and craftsmen, the ordinary people. You see, this is you know just like the ordinary people with everyday life in China. But also, in what, of course, I was doing, which I didn't quite realise at the time, was it was creating an historic document. Mm. Because the China that I was filming is now only found like in a museum. And um, the China then, it's not altogether gone. You still go to areas in China, but you still find a lot of the traditional. But in a city like Beijing, you know, you go up to an area like Sanitun, and it's all gone. You know, it's 21st, 22nd century um, modern world. And it's all people with smartphones, um, you know, expensive clothes, hairdos, you know, all, all the things. And so it's, it's a very different world now. And here we get a coffee served here. This is lovely. This here, thank you. quite important when you are doing the photography that you're not just photographing buildings you're not just photographing the modern architecture but you're, you're creating a human feeling to the place and you know for example I'm doing quite a lot of hotel photography just now and with the hotels I've said I don't want to photograph an empty room an empty dining room an empty bedroom I want to photograph people and people in the hotel to create an atmosphere. A nice warm cup of coffee on a cold winter's day. Deep black coffee here in the middle of Beijing. In the very first cinema in China. This is, for people who can remember, the Cosmo of Glasgow, the GFT of Glasgow, which the Cosmo became. And here we are <laughs> in this very classic film studio in the old part of Beijing. It's a fascinating city, Ian. Very fascinating city. When you... And with Beijing, I've actually got to know it by what we're doing today, by walking. And often, all I do is I'll, I'll do a little bit of walking, then I sit down. Like you've got the photographs of me sitting on a bench or a seat. Well, that's, del that's deliberate. Because I sit there on a bench and I look and I'm looking at the scene of what's happening, what's passing in front of me. What are people doing? What are they, you know, what's the reaction? And quite often people see you and they come up and they'll start talking to you. And they're fascinated where you're from, what you're doing. Pretty fear couple of a this day a few days ago on uh, Friday I was sitting beside the Hai Hu River in Tianjin I was trying to photograph the Mongolian seagulls that have come back that migrated down from the northern Russia and I'm trying to, and here's the the what you call what you, environmental women sanitation but you know it's the cleaner it's the woman that cleans all the this part and she's come over fascinated what was I photographing you know, and she sees this scene every day. Why is this, you know, foreigner? Why is he fascinated with photographing him? I'm trying to show her, you know, these birds, the gulls, photographs. And she was fascinated that you could see something very interesting that she sees in an everyday scene. Yeah. And, and you know, and this is what I'm finding. People now are looking at the photographs. And they're realising that this is a very special archive on the progress of China over what will be very soon 35 years. And if you can imagine Beijing 35 years ago, 
It was a very, very interesting city, mm. but very, very different. So you were actually taking photographs way back 30, 35 years ago? Uh, so. Not nearly enough, Ian, because... Um, it was expensive back then, yeah. The, f the film was very expensive. The film was expensive. Because I had to bring it anyway from the UK. Mm. And you roll a film in 36 exposures, and, you know, 35 mil, 36 exposures, so you're very careful yeah. uh, how much you took. I wish I could, I wish I'd digital would have taken an awful lot more. But also, it was a time factor because I was only in Beijing three days, and you're going to Forbidden City, the Summer Palace, the Temple of Heaven, you know, all classic tourist areas, um, classic palaces. What we didn't see is the everyday city, unless you were seeing it from a bus, you know, or you just have to catch a glimpse when you're going into a restaurant. You just have to see something, but quite often you're in a bus and you're trying to capture images of the street. Um, one time I did go out, but we went back to the hotel for lunch, and as usual it was a long lunch time, so I had a quick lunch, I dashed outside, I photographed all around um, the Friendship Hotel in Hydean. And I'm glad I did because it's now high tech zone, and yet you're looking at guys with bicycle carts. Um, carrying melons in the back, you know. <laughs> and people say, what, that's John Wan Soon. Yeah. So where have you got all the photographs and, and, and could you, do you see yourself displaying them in the future? Or I've, have I've a, had exhibitions, yeah. You've had exhibitions? I actually had the exhibition uh, in, in Glasgow, mm. uh, in the Mitchell Theatre, for example, in, in Glasgow, a big exhibition there. Mm. Uh, that was about Beijing, that was about Chinese, uh, that was in 2000. And I had a permanent exhibition in the Mitchell Library for several months. Um, it was about to June 9. I had an exhibition, guess what, in the Loon Fung restaurant mm. in Sokey Hall Street. Yep. Because the, the owner of the Loon Fung at that time, um, Candy, she was very passionate about you know, developing knowledge amongst the Chinese society in Glasgow of what China was like. So she was having my photographs of Guangdong. So you walked into the, the you know, the entranceway of the rest, but it's all photographs of, um, of Guangdong in southern China. <laughs> um, but most of the photographs now, a lot of these old ones have converted it into digital because, you know, you don't use slide projector anymore. Yeah. It's very cumbersome. So, Bruce, do you have a website or anything? I need to get that done, Ian. Okay. I need to get something done to promote. Um, That's something we should look at. If we don't know how to, then yeah. I can maybe I, help you with that. Um, because this is coming up a special year, Ian. Because mm. <laughs> you share some on LinkedIn and stuff, yeah. don't you? Um, this is coming up for a, a very special year, mm. if I can quickly find my, my iPad, mm. because um, you know, in only a week and a half, we will be into 2022. Wow. You know, if you think about 2022, Ian, the time has passed awfully quickly. I've been mean, a spare second to define this. So, what's that, Bruce? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a book you're producing? I don't know what it is, Ian. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to actually organise uh, talks. Mm. You know, obviously it's now over in Beijing, uh, or some online with Zoom, but very much the, the talk of, um, you know, the China story, mm. of what China was like, how you've seen it change. You know, China 1987, low technology, uh, really, dilapidated buses, people with bicycles. Today you've got um, one of the most modern advanced societies in the world in such a short time. At least you've, 
in in the cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou. That's the case. But um, I've got many people now talking to me about um, you know the thirty-five years. It's quite a significant number. And um, in Griffey and tomorrow, um, doing a radio podcast with major international radio station here. And we're going to have an interview for an hour. An hour? It's not, hour. Long, not daily longer. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll cut it down to half an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's about um, a whole host of questions about uh, why you came here, why did you stay. Mm. Um, <laughs> I keep saying, one of the reasons I end up staying in China I forgot to buy a return ticket to go back to Glasgow. <laughs> I bought a one-way ticket, didn't have a ticket to go back to the train. <laughs> What's my train ticket, Jimmy? <laughs> no, um, you know, it came 1987, and what I saw in 1987 fascinated me. And I came back, lucky enough, in 1992, Strathclyde Regent sent me over. Had I not done that, I don't think I'd be here today. Because China today, it's very modern, you know, but the China then, I just, God, I thought it was amazing. And, and somehow I managed to get all over the country before before it became high tech, before it became developed. So I saw China very much in a very much low technology mode, you know, in a kind of time when it wasn't developed. But for travel, it was very, very interesting. Because we're going into another, almost another, another world. And how did you, all the years ago, how did you get about? Did you go by bus, car? Um, mostly I used train. Hmm. I used the train, but I also used boats. Okay. Because believe it or not, um, China then, using public transport, you could do some fantastic, <laughs> fantastic river journeys. Hmm. Today, on those rivers, more it's luxury boats, it's cruise boats that are operating. But I travel by the ordinary passenger boat, um, right down the Yangtze, uh, or the Changjiang, on a six day river journey. And you couldn't believe that. And, you, and when I got to Chong, uh, when I got to Wuhan, you, were, you could have gone on for another maybe three or four days to get to Shanghai. Yeah. So, I was sailing from the headwaters, the, the, you know, the head of navigation really on the Changjiang, a place called Lushan in Sichuan near Chengdu. I'm travelling for two days down to Chongqing, then four days from Chongqing right through the gorges on the passenger vessel, but they would stop at these local harbours, people coming on their bamboo poles, carrying everything onto the boat. And it was quite rough, you know, because um, even trying to get food in the boat. Uh, it was not like having your modern cafeterias. You were in there with a the crowd, with the farmers, with the peasants, with everybody pushing in. You know, and thankfully, there were some people who would help me, they'd take pity on you and help you to get your food. Or you'd be traveling in a bus in, and you'd be in a bus in the countryside, you know, crowded, people smoking. Upstairs, up above you in the bus, all these uh, baskets with ducks, with geese there, mm. and sometimes you look below your feet. Hey, what the heck is that? And there'd be a circular bamboo box below your feet. Oh my gosh, it was snakes mm. right below you. Thankfully, <laughs> they're in the box, you know. Um, There's a big snake in the plane, Jack! Oh, that's just my pet snake, Reggie! I hate snakes, Jack! I hate them! Come on! Show and you, if, when you're in areas like Guangxi, Guangxi was a, a major kind of breeding ground for, for snakes, mm. which were part of the cuisine in Guangzhou, which I actually managed not to have. No, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. I'll stick to vegetables if you don't mind. <laughs> but um, they were actually rearing snakes and bringing them down to the market and you go into the market and you would see the steak areas in the markets that would make fabulous filming um, I don't know if they still have it now but I did I did take some still photographs of uh, the markets which um, 
you know, well, the uh, fascinating to walk around. <laughs> but that was a long, long time ago. Where would you, where would you sleep, Bruce? Where did you, where did you, where did you live or stay? I, I slept wherever I could. Um, put it bluntly, I slept in the trains. You know, um, on the sleeper, sometimes the hard sleeper, sometimes the soft sleeper. The, but in the towns, you get hotels. The hotels were relatively basic compared to today. They were fine. Mostly they're okay. Some you would book in and you would, you would leave the next morning because maybe this, the plumbing was not right or there's something wrong. And you thought, I don't like this place, but there's plenty of other ones. So you could go around and in your guidebook, you'd always have a mention of um, what could be the best hotel in town. But the best hotel in town always had a building round the back. Right, and if you knew this, you would go and you would say how much for a room. And say no, 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 no. Uh, what, 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 y'all? Lal Bingwen, Lal Bingwen. Mm. Ah, then they know. Oh, he knows, he knows. So around the back would be a, a building which maybe didn't have the luxury fe features of that time, um, say 1997. But they would have a have this area around the back. The prices were much cheaper. You have a, a room with your your. You know, bathroom, quite simple bathroom, the beds were clean, and you had your ticket to go around into the main bit of the hotel, your breakfast ticket. Mm. And you get a room for maybe a hundred, a uh, hundred kwai. But I did stay in rooms in a remote part of um, Yunnan for about five or maybe ten yuan a night. Mm. Wow. That, um, So back then, what would that, was that two quid or something, two pounds? Uh, yeah. Um, that area today that I'm talking about, at the entrance to the Tiger Leaping Gorge Union that has now developed into a major tourism area with uh, boutique hotels, you name it. And Ian, I remember what was really funny, I, I stayed in this, this guest house, it was right behind uh, a cafe called the Backpacker Cafe, you know, of all things. Open fronted, no door, right beside the road where they could get a bus up to the Shang, place called Shangri-La. Uh, it is called now. But I remember I, I spent a day in that cafe um, in between buses and had, you know, good food, local food, but I had, you know, quite a lot of beer. Mm. You had a lot of beer? Uh huh. In the, uh, <laughs> it was really cheap, you know, the, about 1.5 1, 1. yuan a bottle. Mm. And a, a few years later, I was back on a delegation from Scotland. Mm. of, you know, uh, an official delegation to Yunnan uh, province. And we went up to Chialto from Lijiang, and here's some of the, you know, friends from Scotland, they men were all very well dressed and so on. And we stopped at, guess what, the Backpacker Cafe, except it was more across the road now, and it had made, made itself into really quite a, <clears throat> quite a nice restaurant um, with outdoor seating in the terrace. And we came up and the owner looked and she started bust out laughing. She's, that's a Scottish man who drank all the beer. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting there, dear. <laughs> she remembered me and all the other Scots were well, <laughs> you've been caught. <laughs> How can they remember after you know, I mean, all those years? But, um, however, funny enough, I've actually said to people, um, Chinese people, you know, ask me about. For example, what do you think of, you know, travelling in China today? Mm. What do you think of the trains and the hotels? Well, the hotels are excellent. You know, mm. International hotels, the five star, excellent service, fantastic. The high speed trains, 350 um, kilometre an hour. Uh, very, very efficient. But, what? What's wrong? But, there's no adventure anymore. Mm. The adventure has gone. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean? See, when you travelled on the old trains, it was fun, but you had to be adventurous because you never knew if you were going to get a train ticket or not. You never knew if you were to sleep properly, um, if you would get a bed in the train. You never, you know, there was always something that was going to happen, especially stopping at the small stations in the countryside, in the mountains. Always be something going on. Now, you have the high-speed train, 
vroom. You know, it's excellent. It's like, but it's like being on an aeroplane. Mm. And I'm not decrying it. I'm not, I'm not in any way saying that it's bad. Mm. They're trying it. It's been a fantastic, fantastic development. And sometimes I still go on the old trains, deliberately. And, and Chinese people think I'm crazy. <laughs> but I say, I, I go with it. Instead of doing five hours from Chengdu to Beijing, I'll go on a train that took 27 hours from Chengdu to Beijing. You think, you're off your head. <laughs> Because why? Because it's, it reminds me a little bit of the old day, travelling on the train, seeing the people with the bamboo poles coming on at the stations, jumping off at the station to buy some food, and going slow and seeing the scenery. And that is more of the adventure, more of the, the kind of fun, or going along to a dining car. Because on a high-speed train, you don't have a dining car. You go on your smartphone, you can order your food to be delivered from the, the cafe car to your seat <laughs> without even going to any dining car. In the old day, you walk along the dining car, somebody's got a beer, chatting away to you. Um, always want to know what was your salary in Scotland. How much you earn? What's your salary? <laughs> you know. Um, but that's gone unless you use the older transport. The boat journeys have gone. Now it's, you know, modern you know, high-speed luxury boats um, but then that's progress and I've just been lucky although Chinese people think I've been you know brave to have done it because for many of them it was the journey home from college at the spring festival the trains were packed trains were crowded and it, the journeys then were, were pretty pretty you know horrendous but um, compared to today I mean today you book your tickets online, you go onto your smartphone, you book your ticket, even use your, use your phone to actually check in at the railway station, you know. It's, it's, it's a, an enormous change that's happened. Um, but if you know where to go, you can still find adventure in this country. In Beijing, you can still can. <laughs> so any, any closing any closing thoughts or any advice for someone who may want to go backpacking? Obviously, it's a difficult time now, but you know, you must have been, you must have just went for it. I mean, you are from Glasgow. You're, you know, you're adventurous. Thirty, thirty years ago, you just hit the road. You travelled through many places, including China. Before yeah. that, travelled across America. What would be your advice to to someone? He wants to just go and hit the road. Somebody young or whatever. Come and do it. Do it. Yeah. I mean, I actually, um, when I was living in Guangzhou, Guangzhou at that time was was modernising. It was developing into, you know, a future city that is today. But I knew there was another China out there, a China that had not developed. This is nine. This is in 1992, 1993, and I decided right. I wanted to travel into the backwoods to get on the ordinary transport and see what China was like. And one of the journeys I did, I set off a journey that would take me three months. Uh, starting off from Beijing, a journey to the Lake of Heaven in the Tian Shan Mountains of Xinjiang. I went across the deserts, right into the, the far west of China, right up the train, almost up to Tibet, um, crossing wilderness, places where there's no people for hours traveling there's not a single house nothing um i think this is the same china that you have shanghai right? and staying in you know small guest houses in some desert oasis <laughs> that can be fun um, but people were always great to me they still are but people have always been helpful to me in china you know and, um they're, quite, they're always, again, quite amazed that a foreigner is willing to come and travel on his own. I can't speak Chinese and do this. And uh, but the, you, you can you can still find adventure here. And if you get away from the East Coast cities and you travel inland, you can find really fabulous hiking places to walk, places to explore places to do a whole lot of things. However, if you go to 
the high-end tourist resorts, the beach resorts, you'll find that, you know, it's like, you could be, you know, Can Cancun, Mexico or something like that, you know, you, you could be in coastal Italy or something. But you go inland and you'll find the places that are still there in Guayjo, in Yunnan, uh, off the beaten track, and you can still find fabulous. But of course today, the advantage you've got as a young person is you've got so much information online now that you didn't, ha didn't have when I started. And I found the guidebooks that I bought in Glasgow were totally out of date when I came to China. But you can still make an adventure out of it. Bruce, as, as always, it's an absolute mm. just pleasure listening to your tales of your travels in China. And I just wish more people, and I hope, and I think more people will, will get to know you as we share more of your story. So, Bruce, as always, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are in the very first cinema in China having a, a cup of is it Colombian coffee. Colombian coffee. <laughs> This is China. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. My pleasure, Ian.